Hello there everyone and thank you for joining me back here in To you Know The Last of Your Poetry, finally playing as Philip Hart. Now I read the event on screen here in the last episode, so if you'd like to read it again, please go right ahead, but with affection, respect, and esteem. Um, but we got to begin with our focus, the Hart Presidency. FDR, Eisenhower, Kefauver, JFK, LBJ, these titans of modern American politics, despite their disparate background, shared a dream. Ask any two men what it looks like and you'll get the three different answers. For some, it's the prosperity of every American, as we promised in the Declaration of Independence. For others, it's the right to go breathe freely, knowing that your air is clean and your cities are safe. A much needed or much aligned third from north, south to north saw the true liberation despite the odd arrays against them. Dissimilar, but yet beautiful, and optimism unbridled. Their dream glows like a bright red torch, rendered from keeper to keeper so they may someday reach its dry wise cauldron. In 1968, when the flame seems at its weakest, the masters of the Senate pass his torch to the conscience. May, many may take Philip apart for his staid, unassuming heir, enforcing the party line and not much else, but civil rights and gun laws are only the least of what the new president has planned. His interpretation of the dream envisions long, winding roads and rails that extend across the continent from cities. Built a brick to mortar, with his people in mind, imagines a modern a nation where crime is an option rather than a necessity. It yearns for a chance to harness America's awesome potential and direct it towards the betterment of all. The path Hart has built for himself seems rather harder than it should, but the path of good is always hard, else it was never good to begin with. Hail to the chief, as we bid farewell to the old. Hail to the bright new day that beckons for the nation's heart and soul. But above all, hail to the American dream, ever deferred, yet ever in sight. It's a new day in America, and with a new president, some old faces might see, see, might see now as good times any to get their affairs in order. Good season's greetings. Uh, but we do have to talk about cleaning up Wallace's mess. In his fall from grace, Wallace also brought down a great many other things with him, or others with him, to the pits of damnation. America's repute. Uh, as dragged along the mud as a shameful, forceful departure from the White House, America's trust surely shattered like so many window panes in Washington after the riots subsided. America's faith in the noble ideals, forever tarnished by the scandals many had thought are beneath the hollowed office of the presidency. Philip Hart now takes his place, immediately burning with the ashes Wallace has left behind in his dogged quest to burn America down. Violence soars to a fever pitch. Vigilantes run amok, unopposed. Green numbers turn red and falter and dip now in an envious position. Yet everyone hopes against all hope that the last of America's dwindling old guard can bring peace where the presidents of perform cannot. And this hard years heart aired years is because of West Africa and the get the game didn't let us basically complete it, which sucks. The automobiles kick dust from the new highways into the arid lands beyond the city limit. Dry jungles bows or boz wave broad level salutes at any sign of the breeze up high and against the clear noon sky. A steel column arose from the ground holding on its terminus around Coca-Cola's sign stamped right right with the company's signature. A farmer stood in the shadows looking right and left before spitting at him. It had been a hard year for West Africa. He saw his sons go to war, returning home in caskets draped and tricolored. Farmans went away to serve, never to be seen again. The land there, though it was, displayed its grifts, as tidings to ease the burden of grief that too was being taken away from him. He turned his head eastward towards the city of Bamako, growing, accreting, accreting all the riches of his land. He saw the new roads, packed with people from other villages, new buildings stamped in the signage of the American companies. He shook his head. How did it come to this? He saw the soldiers digging into the reservoirs of the earth, diverting into the plantations. In their eyes was a dull blaze of idle disdain. Their ears met his complaints with deft ignorance. He sighed, inching forward little by little, he walked into the city. Things we sacrifice for a living in the Queen of Lilium. Why I'm leaving the Republican Party, some would often say. You are how others perceive you. Beasts, monsters, mortal foes only became so because of their inhumanity. Was incorrigible to certain principles, conviction. These words would surely be seen as a barb, and that perception would spread like a plague post haste. For Phyllis Lafey, that sentence of the Shiro would ever sting her more than any other living being. The sniggering elitist political field of battles has not been kind of conservative throughout history. That was what she wrote with a quiet sort of anger. Today is no different than the last, for she. The sabotage of Taft. Now, the despicable coalition she had called home had betrayed them all. Conservatives from shore to shining shore had looked upon Goldwater to like how the sick looked to a doctor. A subject to savor, the liberals with the forked tongues had snatched that away the golden carrot. One too many times, she said, joining the nationals was her stated goal. MCS and Walsh were not at least stooges for all their buffoonery. They're not tantalous, eternally bound to the cycle. They do not have to be driven insane. Her thin home had betrayed conservatives, betrayed her, betrayed her. The pen became heavier in her hand. She stopped bringing her arm across her eyes for fear tears would mark the article. She looked up in that office full of night's darkness. She imagined a presidential office for herself, where she would select two Republican heroes, giving their portraits a prestigious spot before her desk. That warm fantasy had become cold, for now those eyes were terrifying ones, staring down at her in judgment. She saw in those eyes something horrible, as the pressure she had placed on the pen caused it to shatter. No dawn for the Republicans, and a message from Wallace to his successor, Mr. Hart. I do not wish to acknowledge the fact of your election for some time. The events of last November and some of your rhetoric which you used hurt me deeply. While I've done nothing but pursue my understanding of the national interest, you prompted all, or promoted all manner of discouraging propaganda that smeared myself and my allies as being against the interests of the black man, as I said at the time, the South. This is an opposed advancement of the race, and I myself have been deeply involved in improving their condition through the creation of universities and other centers of learning for them while removing thugs and criminals from their communities. 
For the good of the country, it is very this very issue. That I hope to address now. While you may have won the presidency, many patriotic Americans were deeply alienated by the tenor of the race and the issues which you promoted. They see you as seeking to undermine the checks and balances within the framework of the governmental system. To blur the distinction between local state and national affairs, efforts are already being made within these former two authorities to protect against the dangers opposed by the latter. I implore you to seek a conciliatory approach to those who do not support your candidacy. There's much good that you can do for the development and betterment of our people and their cities, but it cannot be conducted in a way that fosters destructive essentialism or undermines the freedom and liberties. As Henry G. Bowen wrote, The road to hell is paved with good intentions. I will pray that you will accept this fact before a nation must travel down this road itself. George C. Wallace, bottomless distaste by the civil rights dilemma. It has existed since the times of the founders, lasting centuries of dizzying change without having change itself. By the, its name, America's seen blood spilled, families torn apart, loyalties and lands rent in twain, drug, uh, grudges, uh, etched in the aged. <clears throat> Unforgiving stone in or against its pursuit, America had been laid to its lowest point a century ago. Um, and not a few days ago, America teetered dangerously close to a deeper nadir, stopped only by quick action. America has had enough. The people have had enough. Blood shall be spilled no longer. Peace shall be restored. Ancient enmities resolved. Bonds of brotherhood are forged. One way or another, civil rights must be resolved now, lest brother fight brother once more. But, uh, let's see, we have here. We have no transportation reforms, urban stability, welfare, we have no crisis. We might do a review policy agenda to prove a relationship, but I have no idea what our relationship is with. The Senate. So, um, we budget hawks about the conservatives giving us crap about that. Urban wealth is calm. Little America supportive for now. Uh, we're supporting the wishes of the civil rights advocates. Urban new initiative. This is going to change everything basically. And, and if we don't do anything, it's going to get worse. So, but also you can hover over these in generic apartments. You can choose what we can, what we want. Municipal housing, public housing, all stuff like this. Cram schools. Uh, we also have ge generic depot, or big box mar, organized workshops, public library, police stations. We also have a generic lampposts, HPS lampposts, LPS lampposts, residential lampposts. We also have generic roads as well, which is very interesting. So we're going to really explore all this stuff. So we'll see what happens with season screenings. Sitting alone in the Oval Office, uh, decorated according to Janney's direction, adorned with artifacts of the great American past, Philip Hart heard something missing from his life since the inauguration silence. Philip Hart has been sorely lacking in peace and quiet being between meeting cabinet members, organizing staff, coordinating international relations, and generally adjusting to his new life. He enjoyed it briefly until Knock came seconds later, and his secretary appeared in. Mr. President called the White House Secretary. Senator Johnson is here to see you. Instinctively, Hart shot up to his feet and approached the door, meeting Johnson at the room's divide and shaking his hand. Good to see you, Phil, or Mr. President, started Johnson before pausing. The pair chuckled and reminisced about the old days when I was your boss before the senior senator from Texas assumed a more serious tone. I'll be blunt, said Johnson before pausing again, tendering his next words with an uncharacteristic gingerness. I think I'm done. With leadership and well soon, the Senate. Then it'll be Hubert's game. I took out as he said, said it, but a distinct sadness emanated from Johnson. President Hart had known change was coming since Johnson first courted him for the presidency last year, and the unstated gravity of Johnson's request was not lost on him. Beyond the years spent with the, in the hierarchy, Philip Hart and Lyndon Johnson had developed a genuine liking for each other, and Hart was disappointed to see him go. Thank you, Lyndon, for your service in the Senate and for your support to me. Began Hart, smiling with, while withholding his well-being. Uh, welling emotions, and Hubert may not give others the same treatment as you do, but I think I'll do just fine. There's no jumbo there. This elicited laughter from Johnson, who stood to leave, but not before tendering one final request. Oh, Phil, I'll give you one of those pens. So Hubert Humphrey of Minnesota will assume leadership of the Labor Democrat faction. Okay, interesting. The Dick's Grass Board goes further down, but one would be generous to describe the state of America's transportation system as lacking. The nation is littered with partially built highways and railroads wheezing along, the product of numerous presidents, taking a swing in the mist that can effectively connecting the nation together. It's no surprise that more than Phil Hart's priorities have finally straightened the tangled up and its connections and, and the snarls which clog commerce and created an America that hums along as smooth as a V8. Nice. Um, so we're going to keep working on this stuff here. Uh, and we're also trying to suppress the progressive movements uh, at the, and the nationalists, which I already suppressed the nationalists. So, second opinions, eh? Jane Jacobs had, since being sworn in as Secretary of Health, Education, and Welfare, had been required to make a great many phone calls. After so many politicians, businessmen, and concerned citizens, it was good to finally be on the phone with someone she respected as much as Bayard Rustin. Mr. Rustin. It is an honor to speak with you, she said. Your work has been a big inspiration to me and many others. I'm just calling to let you know that the administration is eager to work with you on any and all urban issues. I was glad to hear of your selection, Ms. Jacobs, Rustin replied. To have someone like you in such a high office gives me hope that we could start seeing some real progress, but while I have a lot of hope for what you could achieve, I also have some concerns I'd like to share with you. Jacobs blinked and showed what had come. Please, we've always have been happy to listen. We're always happy to. Obviously, I stand for workers of all races, Rustin said, but the fact is that there's a serious legacy of inequality that needs to be addressed with the black working class. If solutions in black neighborhoods aren't tailored for the specifics of the situations, African Americans can end up left behind. I want to make sure that all this urban renewal doesn't just focus on white neighborhoods. Jacob's first instinct was to buy back something about how, of course, she wouldn't neglect any black neighborhoods. But Rustin had experience with that sort of disappointment. Certainly more than she did. Thank you for the suggestion, Mr. Rustin. I'll discuss your thoughts with the president and get back to you. A new era. New civil rights dilemma. Yes. Um, so yeah, we'll go with that one. 
to do undo the mistake. To many Americans, George C. Wallace entered the office with the highest hopes. Alone, he stood against both the duplicitous Republican Democrats and the fanciful dreams of the new party's progressive and communists. His cause was one of succor and attempt, as a guiding light promising comfort and vigor renewed to a reign so fatigued man, with America's greatest generations behind him, Wallace paraded down the National Mall in his inauguration like Augustus leading a triumph in the streets of Rome, flush of, with victory, praised by men, and all but assured that the Republic will be restored under his rule. The hindsight of having followed a lunatic to his downfall tastes like bitter, dry ash to many Americans' weary tongues, grief and shame will follow them as companions for a good while yet. In the meantime, uh, President Philip Park swears the oath of office under cloudy skies and scattered rain showers. Their supporters came. Out in droves despite the weather, clinging to his uplifting words as rain so fatigued men clinging to what embers burn in defiance of drizzle and damp cold, and every one of them can be found in the irony of the forsaken, having their trust betrayed by one man promised in the world, bestowed the very same trust to another claiming the very same, perhaps they do recognize it, yet bestowed their trust regardless in a fit of desperation, so horrified they are of well, so they would risk another mistake for a chance, any chance, to undo the nightmare he had wrought. The weight of duty bears heavy on the shoulders of every American president since George Washington. Yet in the midst of the nation's greatest crisis in decades, Philip, President Hart, President Hart, it seems, shall bear heavier weights the most. For the American people, he must, so help me God. And we're going to rush it on this way so we can uh, improve academic base, get rid of the American way, as well as remove universal segregation, which is killing our political power gains, uh, securing America's future. Wallace's well, victims remaining, and the extent of his havoc wrought more so. America stepped back in bettering its civil rights, maybe the most notable, so capturing the public's imagination and attention with its violence and rhetoric, but just as uh, aggrieved yet uh, given far less attention as a dismal state of its education system. Underfunded and overburdened, schools all over the country languished for years as it presided over the lowest graduation rates in decades. The wounds may have already been dealt with, and the president says, but it's not too late to stymie the bleeding and restore the quality of education Americans had once enjoyed. A debate retread for the blood soaked fields of Gettysburg to the National Mall's Million Man March. America has fought itself many times over 400 years to definitely, or definitively, settle the colored man's place in society. Many thought it re resolved ever since Reconstruction. As the recent bedlam and cities across the South can attest, they thought wrong. Still, our party's leading figures question the wisdom of rocking the American boat overtly. While well, we all suffered under Wallace's idiocy. What an innocuous overture the cost may lose us the trust and votes we dearly needed to keep the party whole. Pandering for votes can come after the fragments of government are picked up for good and good are picked up and good governance made whole. To the credit, the strategy worked. Uh, at least until Congress booted Wallace out of office. Now the crisis has passed. And his bandits have lost their hold over the deep fissures they've papered. Both left and right have mobilized their machines and their men, lumbering to life to again fight their respective sides in America's many issues. Now there is nothing. The White House can do but either ain't what he can't control or tie its fortunes to either side. Normalcy may be returning to America, but in a fit of myopia. As people have forgotten what normal truly meant. Not an end to chaos, no, but rather a resumption after a century of pause. Forgetfulness seems to be one of Malsa's many Parthian shots. Controversy that will follow the RDC for 28 weeks and back the coalition by negative 5%. Eh, that kind of sucks. But if you want to read that again, please go right ahead. But, let's see. Well, necessary for academia to recover, this will hurt our popularity in the South. Mm, spend a little bit more money, additional funds to undo the damage, school's done, better academic base, yes. Whether it was an earnest, yet short-sighted attempt to save money or an attack on notable wall, wall springs of government or opposition, few can argue the repercussions of the Wallace administration's budget cuts on education, less skilled people enter the workforce, more dropouts who can't get a job, and unemployment rate steadily ticking upwards with every quarter. In a few years' time, Wallace has single-handedly repeated America's economy from improving for years yet. This mistake must be rectified not only for the good of this nation, but also for the good of the citizenry. Effective immediately, the president will restore funding for public schools and educational institutes, institutions back to the pre wall levels. Which, before we do that, we're... Okay, so that's not bad. If we do that one immediately, that would be good for us, so... Separate schools aren't equal schools. Separate but equal, want the mantra walls and his cronies unbashedly uttered in front of the American people when they justified strengthening school segregation laws within and without the South. The white man cannot understand the black man fully, so they went, and neither can the black man understand the white man no matter their shared values and patrimony. Better that each race assign their own skills to teach their own children rather than coerce either race to fulfill a task which they cannot possibly succeed again, so they went. Well done, gentlemen. The seemingly sensible reassurances expectedly turn out to be the window dressing for more sinister tensions. For a while, white districts carried on business as usual. Black districts faced desolation from the already meager budget dwindling into flies through a combination of budget cuts and redistricting, clearly separating the equal only furthered existing inequalities, and the president aims to do away with the concept fully despite the fur the South will raise. We're going to do this one first. Um, what else can we do here? Yeah, nay. So we got to do what we're doing first here. Um, that'll be for the best. Unpurchased stuff. I know we got to wait for all that stuff. Um, yeah, other than that, not much, not much else. Forwarding suggestions. So that in a nutshell is concern. This is concern, Jacob said. Sitting across from President Hart and Vice President, I really think we should listen to the concerns. Chet Morrison's VP, huh? If we try to help black neighbors in a top-down way, not taking the concern into account, we just don't risk our policies being ineffective, we could alienate them altogether. Alienate them, Chap Morrison snorted. 
What are we going to do? Vote for the Nationals? Look, we're professionals. We know what we're doing. I say the Negroes in New Orleans, what's Bay or Rustin done compared to that? I say we do what we want, what we're always going to do, and fix these cities. Jacobs at Bristled. She was about to offer a harsh retort when the president spoke up, dismissing the concerns of some of her most loyal and desperate supporters not the way to make this country a better place, chap. Hart said, didn't turn to Jacobs. Jane, you gotta talk to Russ and before you have the most experience in this area. I'd like you to meet with him, hear out his ideas in more detail, let's see what he can bring to the table. This meeting's adjourned. Yes, Mr. President. Free schools and land of the free. Wallace well, is left behind a bloody mess mangled around and about a field con concertina wire. Cleaning it up will take time. No one can ever tr uh, never surely say things will go back to the way they were before his reign of terror. Regardless, the worst of the damage is being unwound inch by gory inch. Few elsewhere does this show more than reverting his reforms to American education. Streams of money once dropped and now restored have slated or slaked the thirst of schools longing for new textbooks and classrooms. Teachers and students return to their deaths in droves. Like well oiled gear sprung into motion, the great machine of academia now turns with more rust and loss. Rust, loss, and old smoothness are gained with every gyration. If the president has his way, then this beautiful machine will never rust again. Academic events will get better. Last years of the walls will be removed from the school system, preventing any more damage from occurring. And that's what we really want to get to, so. Beach Boys, I'll murder you, and with that, please go ahead. What else do we have here? Uh oh. Please, Reuther, huh? Oh, Heart Monitor and get Global Conflicts. Oh, I'll close out of that one, but no one cares about that for stuff for now. I shouldn't even be here anymore, anyways. How's the home front looking? Not great. We get more command power, but we don't really need that. Smoke and mirrors. How's that going? Miller, affection health is durable. Coalition is lacking. Nelson Rockefeller from responsible Republicans. Democratic Party is durable and terrific. Uh, the Dixcrux is poor and waning. Well, um, we don't have to do anything here. Um, support from the responsible Republicans. Hardline. Responsible is poor. Coalition support is waning. Balance of budget. Budget surplus for 90 days. Well, let's wait for that one. Uh, let's go with the responsible ones. Six and for Tyrannus. Hawkishness. The pursuit of deregulation for 60 days. Um, defend order. Appease Reuther. Well, we're okay with the Democrats, unless they're like Dixiecrats. We'll decrease. I don't want to decrease anything. Dixiecrat support will increase by 25%. Well, I want more. Well, how many more? Do we have more Republicans or more Democrats here? Well, we barely have basically the exact same. Well, god dang it. Um, let's make it easy on ourselves. There you go. Do this one, free schools. And then I'm going to blitz through all this stuff first. Palace Coup in Japan, what the heck? Oh! Well then. Declined. The most important thing to keep in mind about public housing is that if there's any room left for a loophole, Someone used it to keep colored people. Jacob took note as Bayard Rustin spoke to her over the phone. I think that to be effective. Your people need to be proactively monitoring public housing and where people are being excluded, working against that. That's very useful. Thank you, Jacob said. Something I've been meaning to ask you, President Hart wants to present a united front against everyone opposed to our agenda. He'd be delighted to meet with you in public, show the whole country that we're working together. A few beats of silence on the other end of the line, but when then Rosen spoke again. I appreciate the invitation, Miss Jacobs, but I'm afraid I'll have to decline. I just said that the president wants the best for the Negroes, but too much public association between us could bring him some unwanted attention. Jacob rose her eyebrows. I don't follow. Rosen said, I'll say that I trust the president to do what's right without me standing by his side. I don't want to make, make, take any glory. I just want him to make this country better for all of us. And if he doesn't, the American Negroes will be out there to remind him of his promises. An unsung hero. What the heck happened to Japan? I've never seen a coup happen here. Huh. What do they do? Dynamic harmony. Huh. Still building up a lot. Oh, we deem war grid power, do we not? That's why we're building all these guys up, so. Cuff to the chair. What is this? Re breaking the heart of the world. Has managed the initial trials of his presidency. The Truman Doctrine. Worldwide democracy for decades. New blood. So I'm going to resume regarding American mediated path to peace. Breaking the ice. Oh, a treaty port negotiations. Well, that's kind of cool. I didn't know that we could do that. Let's one next. So I want to get all this stuff done first. It's going to take a while for, before we can get anything over here, which sucks, but well, let's see what we can do. Man, no man for stage rights. So we can't do this one because we're not very gold water. we got to quiet the remaining backlash. Speak with both sides, but the stones we must throw. Hmm... Is one of instability civil rights will be a start of March. But strong as we must throw. It's the only way for America. Um, gain muted. Muting process. Oh boy. Speaking of both sides. 
Putting out the fires, Wallace has fired a sand left behind infernos that are quickly taking hold of all parties. Disorganized by the ongoing chaos, America is momentarily paralyzed. Politics can only try to douse. Its own fires are waited out, however, can before ruining normal governance. As head of their own party, the president is obliged to take the charge not only in restoring order nationwide, but also many of the parties burn wounds. Only when recovery has begun will they be able to return to a condition to represent the American people once more. Negotiations impending. French exiles and those holding the fort back home wait with bated breath. The plan is clear and reminiscent of the Odyssey itself. Sail from West Africa along the curve of the Atlantic coast and into the Mediterranean to reach the final destination of southern France. There's only one issue, that of the rock that controls the world, Gibraltar. Without Iberian consent to sail several hundred troops and warships through the strait, the dream of reclaiming France may well be dead in the cradle. Across the next week, French and Iberian diplomats will meet in secret in Madeira, discussing conditions and terms between the two nations that may allow the fleet to pass. While historical rivalries and fears of a renowned friends, eclipsing Iberia shadow the talks, the tone so far seems to be generally cordial and supportive. Madrid has lived under the Colossus of the German Reich for almost 20 years, and the potential to rip apart the Nazi dominion over the most of Europe is highly tantalizing. Only time will tell the Iberians go forward with the great reversal of the historical trend that has so far allied itself to the German cause. Marianne calls, will Madrid answer? Silence the progressives. I'll see that one first. The American left were more vocal in their opposition to Waltz than their right. They possessed both the prescience. Uh, pres prescience? I can't even say that right now. To glimpse the inevitable state of his presidency and the will to defy him at every turn. After having been proven right, they both celebrated his downfall and loudly reminded everyone that they were right. The president agrees with them that Wallace and others besides, other things besides, but now is not an appropriate time to act smug. Such behavior will eat away at the silvers, or slivers of unity the government has left. Yet if they break away, then the hope of a functioning Congress will soon follow. For the time being, the president will reproach the progressives and their allies in private and ask them to desist until we get things in better order. Past precedent. Uh, present problems require, share many similarities with their equivalents in the past. For all the strides modern man has made since the dawn of fire, human nature has evolved little sense. Wars, for one, are still waged in the name of desires whose ancestors, thousands of years removed, would recognize wealth, prestige, revenge, principle. The same can be said of the solutions man employs. Because of the cooperation compromise, the Greek stonewall Persia's mighty armies. Scientists developed innovations that shaped history, and the backwoods colonials birthed the world's mightiest republic. Yes, people agreements have accomplished just as much as the armies men resort to mustering should agreement fail to manifest. These agreements also are what America's governing party needs to act as a country's duly elected government. As it is, ideological divides and personal vendettas have hamstrung its ability to pass civil rights legislation, much less laws for other or less taxing issues. For this paralysis, it lingers much longer to stick for the next four years. The president must act post haste to bring the party together. Unity begins with earnest dialogue, as the founders can attest. Let's hope we can clean up his mess. Call me the conservatives. Now that Wallace is a victim from office, people have taken to blame America's conservatives for his extension. Coupled with reinvigorated. Oh, if you're with us, please go ahead. Um, debate on civil rights. And the conservative movement now finds itself both beleaguered from progressives, renewed attacks, and weakened from the infighting that characterized the terminal stage of Wallace's administration. The president knows their hearts are in the right place, and that they feel remorse for having enabled such a disastrous presidency. By calming them down with token concessions to civil rights, the president will remove a major source of concern for American conservatives, in turn making them more amenable to cooperation. Speak with both sides. By some miracle, the left and right finally calmed down. The heavy tension that had undergirded sessions after Wallace's impeachment had faded away, now replaced by the familiar vitriol exchanged by the adversaries on a regular basis. Barbs may not flow freely in Capitol Hill, but no longer do congressmen spend hours running over gridlock instead of running the country. While cooler heads prevail, the president seeks to better both uh, bring both houses of Congress in order. A few more visits and promises might just be enough to achieve this before the rest of the government falls into a similar dysfunction. The line in the conscience. The President's Room. Uh, the Capitol's very own office for P P POTS, or POTS, though often disregarding this use in favor of the classic uh, Oval Office, of course. The uh, current occupant found comfort in the room. Phil Hart was a senator for almost ten years, a relatively short time in comparison to the numerous other senators, but held an important place in his heart. The Capitol building was a center of all that legislative chaos and politicking that Hart adored, and he reveled in the opportunities to connect it to it. Most important to Hart, however, was the room's proximity to the chambers of his old friends, one, one which was entering. Let's do this one anyways. Like Ted Kennedy, before he even sat down on the ornate couch, began listing his agenda, immigration reform, affirmative action, and quotas, legislation for the disabled, large-scale expansion of welfare services, and most importantly of all, a universal health care system. Hart looked at Kennedy right in the eyes and side. I don't, Ted, I don't know. There's a lot there, and I don't know if I can get that political capital in the cabinet. Kennedy didn't look disappointed. As well as protege, Ted Kennedy shared many philosophies with the president. Along with idealism, or a characteristic of the brand of liberalism was patience and caution. Don't push too far, as stated progress is better than no progress. Phil thought about the relationship. Phil was no stranger to friendships with his colleagues, but Ted's unabashed liberalism stood out. Phil looked back at Kennedy's wanting eyes and began to speak. Look, Ted, you've been such a good friend and fantastic senator. We can figure something out. They both smiled and talked about family. And so a mission is born. President Hart will begin continue mentoring his protege to Kennedy through his tenure as president. A decision to pursue health insurance reform has been unlocked in the desk of the president. Oh, ring of Kennedy. Working with Ted Kennedy, Hart will take on the challenge to provide all Americans access to affordable health care. Well, we kind of got that with Medicare. Lock, lock all focuses of proposed bills until act is voted upon. The price of life. Oh my god. Um, addressing the situation at hand. Because we need... Because I want to do this one. 
Um, so we can get this one done and we can sign the Civil Rights Act. Ironically, Wallace did himself and his supporters little favors by attempting to reverse what progress America had made in the civil rights. He sought to reignite the American people's passion towards the Great Crusade against tyrannical government, but in doing so, it inflamed the ire of those who saw past with bluster and civil veneer. He sought to advance the rights of the states, but in doing so, it compelled the federal government to commit many egregious violations against them. His hatred for the black insisted, instead became the black's greatest asset. By the time his face kissed the White House lawn, uh, support for the civil rights had reached high, highs unprecedented, and he's only himself to blame. Now it's up to the new president to address the already intensified debate over civil rights. The task of bringing Congress to accord over this issue will not be easy, but neither will the president Congress shirk from it. To the man and woman, they enter the Senate chambers in a single file. Their strides swivel with confidence from one step to the next. A far cry from the terse, stilted, strut the carriages days ago. They leveled easy grins and curtsies at one another as they paved towards their proper seats in America's most powerful semicircle. Where before the silence of stiff, a sifles would freeze their attention towards their dyes. In case their smiles were cold and sincerity, now they shuffled into their seats, wiped sweat, beating on their foreheads with napkins sifted through the documents of their binders, yawned from the last dredges that sleep away. While friends and allies exchanged pleasantries in the same breath as grand plans for bells, functions, and elections, rivals exchanged harsh barbs and retorts instead of ignoring the others' presence altogether, others were content to bask in an ambulance or ambience of both foreign and familiar before the daily prayer. Animus had returned to the party thanks to no small part to the president's efforts to mend the fissures walls they left behind. It was with this renewed energy which the government's most esteemed lawmakers greeted the vice president, the Capitol chaplain, trailing behind him on yet another day in Capitol Hill. Never thought I'd be glad to hear the roll call, muttered a senator as, as old as pines. Seems very idealistic, but the price of life. Yesterday, the committee interviewed several pharmaceutical executives regarding the cost of certain medications, drugs, and tonics. Their testimony, in conjunction with the information gathered last week from the Blue Cross Blue Shield, show a clear problem in drug and treatment costs, as Ted talked. Phil wrote an assortment of thoughts on a straight piece of paper. We must really do something about this, Ted exclaimed passionately. Phil looked up at him. I already agree with you. Save your energy for the Senate floor, Ted nodded, and slumped back to his seat, staring at the wall. Yeah, I know. It's just this healthcare thing, man. It's so screwed up, Phil laughed. Watching Kennedy grow his own, so something to behold. No longer was Ted just the youngest of a large, prosperous New England family as a senator, a politician, a fighter, a dreamer. Hart broke his thoughts away and began questioning Kennedy once again. What can I do to help? Who, do you have, who have you talked to? I haven't worked with Reuther. He's pretty incensed by this whole thing, too. He's on board with me here. We've been discussing what the health care reform is actually going to look like, and we think we've reached an answer. Kennedy stopped, presumably for dramatic effect at work, and Phil raised an eyebrow in anticipation. My proposal is a single payer universal health, health insurance. It's a need for the American people. Hart was, un was surprised. He didn't expect that big of a bill, but nonetheless, he would put his strength behind Kennedy. That's the old America, Phil said. Do we get decisions for this at all? Because Congress votes on the bill. Uh, transportation. I clicked on that one just to see what it would be like. Uh, well, I guess we don't got very much right there. Those living glass houses. <clears throat> I haven't seen a future of glass houses. Oh boy. The inhabitants of the house that is miracle quick to trade their old temper with the beauty of glass. Now glass chandeliers dangle from glass ceilings, glass balustrades, flank the sides of glass staircases, glass doors complement glass doorways and engraving the etched on glass. Now one mistake can cause a tragic cascade of shattered crystals digging deep into this master's flesh and causing all sorts of other terrible harms. As much as someone would like to trade glass for timber, others claim for the glass to stay. The progressives will take care of to know that America is now a glass house. They must speak out of a genuine desire to ail the American people's suffering, but they are no less affected than the rest of us if the American house shatters from a misstep. Our presidency is one of instability, and civil rights will be the starter match for the battle for Eastern Rush. Interesting news has landed on the president's desk this morning. After years of preparation from regional level states in Russian anarchy, the grand principality of Central Siberian Russia, uh, Central Ru Siberian Russia, or Central Siberian region, and the Far Eastern Soviet Socialist Republic and the Russian Far East have declared war on each other. Oh boy. The outcome of this war will most likely determine the success of one half of the former Soviet Union, and as such, it is of great importance that we support the state which would be friendly to America, and no offense. What may potentially put, see potential ends for each different country, advisors suggesting a course of action be taken soon in order to best improve our chances of making a difference in this conflict. The director of the CIA has assured the president that their men are standing by and a multitude of options assist each nation. Whatever the case is, the president eventually stands up, clears the throne, makes a decision, let him fight. He did debate. Bro, across the aisle. I mean, we still need the nationalists, probably. But if I can't see what we're, we're, what the votes are like, then there's nothing we can do. So... Um, to Arkutsk party faction, Arkutsk party faction, uh, honestly, I, I just support this side, it would work the second, you know, Look, just so much more manpower, industry is about the, roughly the same, um, he has more divisions, not saying they're better necessarily, but they have, he has way more manpower, I'm going to assume he's going to win, so, uh, we're good. 
Key to debate. None stoke the American uh, public spirited, almost vitriolic opinions more than civil rights. We're a democracy, habitually proclaiming its fundamental uh, values. Discourse over the extent to which it applies said values is and should be given. Carefully handled, however, most governments can choose to ignore this debate while they manage other pressing concerns. While it's handled poorly, as a duty obligated janitor is cleaning up as many mistakes as we are left with no choice but to press one ear into the public pulse at all times. Our observations create a picture of violence and disorder gripping all the forms of discussion over civil rights. Passionate souls engage in riotous behavior to prove their point. A postman intervene and uphold the law's uh, points. Rinse and repeat in upended bar rooms, barricaded streets, broken homes nationwide. Meanwhile, observers and pundits lambast the government supposedly in action. Criticism that conveniently forgot to level towards its equally impotent opposition. Something must be done if only we are to be seen doing something. Fight for your life. It was a busy day in the Senate. Well, busier than usual, Senator Ted Kennedy was giving a speech. It's first since introducing the new health insurance bill. While I was no stranger to public speaking, Kennedy was still quite nervous. Well, that was on the line here. Convincing a couple of senators would be the difference between free access to life-saving car care and a slew of preventable deaths. To prepare, um, Kennedy approached his old friend and now the, the President of the United States, Philip Hart. As Kennedy began to speak, his anxieties melted away, subsumed by confidence. Hart leaned back in his chair, mentally taking notes. When Kennedy finished, looking up expectantly, Hart leaped or leaned forward and spoke. Tone down the wording, and throw in some catnip for the moderates, make it palatable and all that, Kennedy nodded, looking down at his papers to think. You're going to kill it, you can get this through, I know that, said Phil. Uh, Ted looked back up at Phil. Darn right, I'm not going to let this chance pass me by. Satisfied with the show of young idealism. Uh, Phil flips Ted a pen, and Kennedy quickly scribbles his revisions on the resolute desk before heading out of the door. Good luck, Ted. Presented to the Senate, oh boy. And yeah, progressive protest in D.C. Oh, Shnikes. Um, it's almost 1970. Year of big changes. Well, some changes. Sure, why not? We actually have something else that's finally updated. Defense artillery? Nice. 21 billion? That's 150 billion in, uh, you know, debt? Good. Expanding a lot of the stuff? Good. Um, academic base getting way better? This is going to hurt us a lot. Oh well. Healthcare is stagnant. Oh, healthcare quality. Developed healthcare. Oh, this is new. Healthy poverty rate decrease. Oh, that'd be nice to get. Developed healthcare versus advanced healthcare, world class healthcare. Well, where's the cost for this? I'd imagine there'd be some sort of cost, right? Like, developed healthcare, I mean, maybe not, I don't know. I think there'd be some sort of a cost, like, you know, developed healthcare versus advanced. I mean, depending on, I guess we're dynastic liberals, I guess, here now, but, like, it is what it is, I guess. I don't know, I'm not the one doing all this stuff, but, you know. Progressive protests. Today in Washington, D.C., has parlayed increasingly common disturbance. Demonstrations, uh, thousands strong, carrying picket signs, placards, and posters, shouting slogans and pithies at the top of their lungs, and leaving behind a trail of garbage they lumber from street corner to street corner. Meanwhile, riot police assemble in palisades with shields and truncheons. Journalists seeking for prime viewing spots like VP, VIPs and concert hall encounter protests to make additional head, uh, headaches out of law and order. This time around, it's civil rights activists and their allies parading up and down the National Mall, proclaiming champions of the colored man's rights, among other things, that are by nature proclaimed to make a mess so the world will hear words. Why America should listen to common knowledge like a broken vinyl record they have yet explained, but these modern day penitents continue the righteous crusade regardless. Less imperil governments would consider such demonstrations as little more than brush strokes on the vibrant mosaic defining liberal democracy's discourse. For us, however, they are manifestations of the dysfunction. Wallace had racked into American politics or the gouges he had made out of its extent cracks, the root causes must be addressed before we can ever move on. And the windows of opportunity are narrow and brief, so... 4 to 19, say... So okay, no oh god, oh, 48, no, yeah. Chop and pray. Republicans in a national become more inclined to vote for the bill of loss of progressive support. Uh, efficiency of the average, ooh. Civil rights advocates pay the price. Progressives would be more for the loss of Republican. Seven more versus these guys. Urban wealth increase their disdain. What do we do? That one. Chop and pray. Four. That helped us not at all. And also, if this doesn't go well, we won't do this one. But amid the crowd of internationals in Georgetown, tops a typically populated San Sushi. Samantha stood out. She was a failing b less actress and nearly at the end of a row. So the chance to mingle among high society seemed like a godsend. Reservations emerged when she was sitting in a booth reserved by her day for the night. We left her alone for nearly half an hour before we arrived. But when the esteemed doctor did show up, he made no grand entrance. He was t tired. His tie was undone, and he used it to clean his glasses as he piped down across the Samantha. Then, as if noticing his dinner guest prison for the first time, his grumpy demeanor flipped. It must be Samantha open, smiling, raising his otherwise low gravelly voice into a cadence, approaching charisma. I'm Henry. Samantha accepted a handshake, mildly bemused before Dr. Kissinger opened up with a flurry of questions. What did she do? Where was she from? What did she like? What did, did, she, did she like politics? And shortly after the appetizer, what were her thoughts on foreign policy? 
Well, I don't like German. The feeling is mutual. He assured her, and the fuzzy hair Bavarian leaned into the lever what felt like her speech. The world is split, more or less, between three poles of international power began, articulating his points with hand gestures, but this multipolar world order cannot hold. If Japan were to ally with Germany, then America would be doomed. Doom, scary stuff for chit-chat and claims and clams, thought Samantha. Germany is a revolutionary state and cannot be trusted. The United States must open diplomacy with Japan if we want any hope of containing Nazism. He paused the oration for a sip of water, and Samantha wondered out loud, so you going to Tokyo? Huh, perhaps. Their talk soon tapered off, and Dr. Kissinger paid the bill. After exchanging p parting pleasantries and a vague promise to meet again, the man from Harvard left her on doorstep, or apartment, on her apartment doorstep. She concluded that it wasn't really her type, and the feeling must have been mutual since that was the last time they saw each other. Make dinner, not war. So... We did what we had to. Got all 18 Democrats. The Nationalists, we were supposed to get more support, but that didn't happen. Segregationist protests in D.C. Oh boy. Today in D.C. Uh, it's partly to increasingly common disturbance. Oh. I have that. Please go ahead. Um, this time around, the segregation center is spreading up and down the National Mall. Rare comes the occasion where the staunch advocates of America's crumbling status quo adopt their adversaries' tactics. When they do, however, they holler and run much as ably as any socialist agitator worth the title. Residents of the nation's hollowed capital have been treated to particularly vivid examples thereof, complete with white hoods, red belt banners, and pickup trucks. Less and pro governments would consider such demonstrations as little more than brushstrokes in the vibrant mosaic defining liberal democracy's discourse. So, uh, for us, however, they are manifestations of dysfunctional walls of into American politics, or the gouges they have made out of its extracting cracks. The root cause must be addressed before we move on, can ever move on. The windows of opportunity are now narrow and brief. Stones we must throw. Having seen a future of Glass House, inhabitants of the house that is America were quick to trade old timber with the beauty of glass. Now, glass chandeliers dangle from his glass ceilings. Glass. Oh, there is one, so. Yeah. Not bad. There you go. Yeah, this is not going to go very well for us. Oh, chop and pray. Be more inclined. So, four and five. Okay, so let's see what happens when we fail. Because this should not be failing. I know this is probably bug too, but I don't have time to play through all this again, probably. So, so if it fails, there's no bill. Utilize a coalition. That's something we must throw. As we'll continue on with quiet the remaining backlash, one way or another, America must resolve its civil rights alone before we can ever move on to verdant pastures. Thus, after months of deliberation, the president has chosen to side with the nation's progressives in their own onwards march to a promising future. Not all the music went to the pure or the writing of the past and justice, however. Just as much effort was spent on predicting the fall of such a move in America's conservative half, needless to say, this is pleasure. Though weakened by walls itself induced damage, while bellow loudly from atop chimneys, church steeples, and Capitol Hill's marble dome itself, care must be taken to subdue these voices before they coalesce into a dagger aimed at our throats. Let me have to say, right? South will be pleased. <clears throat> They're all very quick. Um, let's get through all this stuff first. A new America. America's story has been conceived as a tale of mankind's desire for freedom triumph against the new world's dangers and the old world's ancient blood feuds. Our nation is a poet's told it is, a shining city top of hell whose shores teem with men from all walks of life and all the corners of the earth, blessed with the chance to craft new names and lives for them and theirs. Yet as the dark deeds done the un unto the colored manner brought to light, America stands in shock as we witness how far our beloved myth diverts us from stark reality. Uh, Wallace says ugly downfall must not be wasted, for his ousting unveils a rare opportunity to break from our ugly past and enter the warm light of renewal. I stand before you today with the fullest confidence that a new America, one that shall strive truer to its founding principles than ever has been, has arrived in earnest. So, here we go. A failed bill is nothing spectacular on the hill. Most dreams eventually die, both Ted and Phil knew the going in, but regardless of expectations, the scene of defeat was present. Hart contemplated this when in this phone rank, particularly Kennedy on the other side. And sad for seeing all words, they fell, yeah, the bill, bill failed. I've talked enough about that today, Kennedy said with a bit of an odd pep. What's going on with Chip? He wanted to talk to me, but I didn't. I just couldn't face him. Ted said his uh, thin veneer of apathy cracking as he spoke. Slots. Phil, I'm sorry. I got tropes up and I could have done more to get it passed. Kenny's voice cut out and all that remained was the sound of the deadline. Hart didn't move. Poor Kennedy. Phil considered Ted an actual close friend beyond all the politicking and blowing that clerk Washington. I could tell the bill's favor affected Ted. The next day, after morning debriefing, Hart tracked his way to the Senate chambers to console his friend in person. He tracked down Ted in another senator's office, sharing a bottle of whiskey. After berating the other senator and sending him away, Hart closed the door and stared at Kennedy. It's just one bottle. Yeah, we lost. It's partly my fault. How could you attack him to Chep? All you would have discussed would have been me. But failure happens even to a president, even to a Kennedy. Healthcare is your darn passion. Do you, don't you want to do something about it? Kennedy nodded. Well, get your butt up and get back to work, Phil exclaimed, finding Reservoir Power ass deep within Kennedy Rose and reach for the phone. I'll talk to Walter, so. Um, I'm probably honestly going to use Cons Commands to go back before the election, make sure Walls uh, does lose, because it is a little bit bugged still, but the MPP has way too many, the, the National self way too many senators, 
you know we've been really successful but I want to make sure that our, when we do fill part for the first time I want to be as successful as possible but focus on the true evils but I'll do all that stuff like after this episode so I can go through the next episode a little more successfully despite our manifold differences every part of America's political landscape unanimously agrees that the nation's evil pale in comparison to the atrocities orchestrated by the Germans and Japanese past and present there's no exaggeration to attest that hatred of fascism binds the union together as good as glued as to sheet pa sheets of paper which beats the priorities of the point of contention but progressive moderate and conservative alike will share should no tears for either tyrants in an inevitable downfall, reminding all Americans of the shared antipathy. Maybe necessary to orient the sh ship of state amidst the stormy waves of today's discordant times. National Security Advisor. The concept of national security at uh, uh, side of the intersection of foreign relations and defense policy. Thus, any suitable professional advice on this subject should come from someone quite familiar with both. From which, from the perspective of Philip Park, Harry, Henry Kissinger had neither of them. The Harvard doctor's prior academic experience was brief, impressive enough, but did a successful literary career or a brief army stint qualify him to speak with such authority on matters of national security? And President Hart's uncertainty on the subject persisted past the 100, first hundred days of his administration, and Dr. Kissinger remained in office solely to please Nelson Rockefeller. After their standard bi-weekly Oval Office briefing on national security, Philip Harding and Henry Kissinger started talking about dreams. My dream is to establish a diplomatic consensus with Japan and extricate Germany from world affairs, broached Kissinger, whose calm demeanor betrayed his inner nervousness, even as a political disconnect. Kissinger knew establishing a detente between the United States and Japan was an incredibly volatile political decision for an American president. It figured to be a tough sell, seconds passed and silence before Hart spoke up. You mean to... Negotiate? Why? No, why? The ports? The deal swirled between pros and cons behind the president's thoughtful eyes until he reached a conclusion. That's dangerous, but I think you know that, he paused. Go ahead, look into a... Uh, but uh, be discreet, Dr. Kissinger smiled and nodded, jumping to his feet with a hitherto or two concealed energy. As Kissinger... <coughs> excuse me. Moved to exit. President Hart called out, Henry, be sure to tell the Secretary of State about this. Maybe he can help. The National Security Advisor nearly scoffed at the suggestion, but managed to over smile. smile. As if, Mr. President, that was too important to us ruining the, by those two just at the state. Sure to let him know. So the Civil Rights Act. It had taken no small amount of goodwill and political capital, but the presidents gathered enough support in Congress to finally push the Civil Rights Act through the Senate and House of Representatives, hopefully. Now this piece of tumultuous legislation lies atop of the resolute desk, smaller than its many drafts that have ever been, accompanied by somewhat muted jubilation within the Oval Office. All it awaits is a handful of strokes etched in black fountain ink by the highest office in the land to become ironclad law. When is this one first, though? I'm going to get this one last. No man for states' rights. The United States is not simply a single entity, rather. It is a federation of 50 separate states linked by the chains of perpetual union through shared identity and whose unified direction is decided by the consensus of an assembly of elected statesmen. This unique arrangement just five requires some form of leeway for the states subsumed into one politic to act as their own, their, on their own accord, in most cases giving these states the powers they enjoy as constitutional rise a good goal worth lauding. The same cannot be said for Wallace's own acts to improve states' rights. But short, a man who wields the federal government like a mallet to force laws in Congress only has states' rights as a tangential, tangential, gen, oh, oh my god, tangential goal best. We should best get to work undoing the damage he's dealt to otherwise notable goals repute. Reclamation impending. Looking at a world map, one would be uh, forgiven th for thinking that the French spirit had been extinguished, utterly submitted to the Nazi jackboot that now rests over Europe. All that remains visible at once Victor the Great War is a series of territories in West Africa loosely linked to Paris by the hastily added legend. Looking at the Porte de Car, however, we're resulting in a different story entirely. Across the glittering sea float vessels of all types, frigates, corvettes, destroyers nearly 34 years old, so jury regged to work by sheer determination alongside modern ships fresh from the dockyards of the New World. United in coming cause to sail one last time across the coast of Africa through the Strait of Gibraltar back to the into the Med and into the land of South, southern France. Defeatists may call his determination romantic folly or stubborn ignorance of reality. However, to the troops drilling in the ad hoc camps, ranging from the grizzled 50-year-old veterans to the fresh-faced volunteers that sailed across the vastness of the Atlantic to liberate his blood home soil. There's only one name for what, and what just under one month will surely be the greatest adventure of our life. Reclamation. So, um, <clears throat> a rat in sheep's clothing. Never before has state rights been so associated with segregation as it is today. As expected, of a simpleton, with little in the way of tact. Uh, Wallace never once erred from speaking of restoring the rights of states to choose their destiny in the same breath as keeping the equals separate. Did he truly kill a for states' rights when he attempted to enforce, to enforce segregation in the North, or when he cut much needed funds for the American public schools in the poorest of America's states? No two ways around it. Wallace exploited the public sympathies for the liberties of their states in order to violate these very same liberties across two thirds of America. It took time to untangle the mess he had left behind in local laws, but restoring faith in it is an integral part of America's political system, which is worth any effort. The sign. And here's a common area to be shared by the residents of the block, available to any residents of St. Louis. The public housing official said to President Hart, who gazed about keenly, a playground for their children, benches, they said, and grass for all sorts of games. 
Excuse me, what's that? The president politely asked, indicating scrawling writing on a nearby wall. Grimacing as it had not been covered up in time for the visit, the official approached with heart to decipher the vandalism. The president did not read the word, his lip curling at the vile slur daubed in the wall. To be frank, sir, we've had issues on that front. The official man named Theo said, adjusting his tie, local residents think public housing means that more black people will be in the neighborhood and we've had complaints. How common is this? Are there other incidents going beyond vandalism? Fairly common, unfortunately. Racist fear is spreading among local whites. They're all afraid that the new black residents will bring crime or cut their wages and crowd their schools. Blacks are all aware of how the whites feel, but just want a better life. The community is divided further and further by the day. Theo trailed off, suddenly aware of how freely he was speaking to the President of the United States. Philip Hart frowned. Soon the graffiti, a graffito, like it was a venomous insect. This was his enemy, the bigotry, the closed-mindedness. They would overcome it with time working with words, but not today. He turned away, urging Theo to continue his presentation, even as a growing rich attention nod to the President's mind. Paint over that nonsense as soon as you can. To prevent a devastating crisis, decisions to curtail race rights have been unlocked. Interesting. Saving uh, state rights. Rehabilitation is neither easy nor fast, as accident victims can attest. The body needs time to recover from grievous wounds, and even longer to cope with the loss of an organ or limb. Only through repeated exercise, not a little guidance, can a victim perform as well as they used to. In some cases, their past performance will forever be lost in the scene of the crime. Restoring the prestige of state's rights in this nation is no different, with the disrepute it had gained under Wallace's tenure administrations. Only a proportionate amount of outreach and reassurances to the once bitten American people can ever convince them to throw their weight into it again. That said, the South will surely look favorably upon someone willing to help their dearest cause. President meets the president. And president Hart hadn't truly appreciated how much of his first days in office would be consumed by talking on the phone. Cause senators, governors, executives, and ambassadors, though, offend even the German Fuhrer. But now he took what he could be the most important call, yeah. Both are right there. The face of the American labor movement had no official political position, but Hart needed his support to enact his agenda. Mr. President, glad to be able to finally pay my respects. Troy Arthur's voice was high pitched, but somehow still sounded strong. I think I speak for all American workers when I say, We're overjoyed to hear of your victory. We stand ready to support your pro worker programs in any way we can. Thank you, Mr. Roythram. I'm glad to hear that. Uh, Hart scratched the back of his neck, searching for the right words. I have to admit, I was a bit concerned about all the attention your people gave to progressive congressmen during the campaign. We have to clear his throat. Well, Mr. President, I'm not beholden to any party. My interest is, is the interest of the labor movement, nothing, nothing more or less. Hart went, not exactly off the right foot. My apologies, Mr. Roythram. Just making a little joke. The progressives should be supporting much of our agenda going forwards anyway. No harm done, Mr. President Reuther replied. Rest assured that regardless of what we do for the progressives, you're, my man, you're our man now. I know, you, you're the one of the working man's greatest allies. If you don't mind too much, I'd love to meet you in Michigan to discuss how we can work together for the country. A hand extended. Uh, president Hart will be working with the UAW's Walter Reuther through his tenure as president. The decision to enact environmental protections has been locked. A rat in cheap's clothing. Never before has state's rights been so associated with segregation as today. Did I read this one already? As expected of a simpleton with little in the way of tact. Uh, Wallace never once aired from speaking of restoring their states of rights to choosing their destiny. Oh yeah, I did read this one earlier, so. Here's this game, please go ahead. So, the game, like, was lagging extremely hard. Homecoming with Walter. Spread goodwill across the country and push for the environmental protections. So we already tried and failed earlier, so we might as well see what this one's going to be like, too, but then across the aisle. So, voting in favor. we do that one, that one, and we can do that one next. I don't know, we'll see what happens. Um, we're going to have to redo this a little bit anyway, so... Uh, which sucks a lot. Oh, and the game's gonna crash again. Probably because it's now June 14th, which really sucks. I wish it would stop crashing, but, you know, um, if that's the case, I might just end the episode right here, because we'll see. I'll probably play with the update that is gonna come out, so. Um, hey, if you enjoyed what Philip Hart has had in store for us so far, please do consider leaving a like. Subscribe if you're new. Check out my Discord link in the description below, and I'll see you tomorrow as we see what else we can do with Philip Hart. Thanks for watching. Have a great, great, great rest of your day.